So Richard, um, what, what are dreams? Uh, how, what, what do dreams tell us about ourselves? And how do we use uh, that information to become better people? Over to you. Thank you, Shrikant. Um, and hi, everybody. Uh, it's great to be back here again. Um, I enjoyed last week. And uh, this topic's really interesting because I've recently started going to see a Jungian analyst again and started writing down my dreams. And in the last week, I think I've written down one every single night. It's been quite a busy time. Although I assume like most of the time I'll be doing this anyway. And actually, I've been avoiding writing down my dreams because it, it makes me wake up earlier than I would like to. I don't get that extra bit of snoozing. There's that period I feel when you're trying to write down a dream, you get that second where you go, right, I could now wake up and I've got to quickly grab something and write this down now, otherwise it's going to be forgotten. And um, so now I've started taking that moment, but that means I'm, I'm awake from that point and that's it. And I don't get to snooze anymore. But it's fascinating what's coming up. Um, you know, what, what are dreams? That's the question Shrikant asked. Well, I mean, they're an experience. I think that's the one thing we can say. They're, an, they're a phenomenon. They're a phenomenological experience, something that goes on in the mind that essentially we are the only party to that experience. Um, you know, they're a personal thing. I see them as something that arises, you know, it's from the unconscious mind. It's something... And Jung talks about the symbol, the symbol in the dream. You know, there's something, often a message in the dream, something that we could become aware of if we can pay attention and, and work out what the meaning of that symbol is to us. But it's kind of shrouded in, in this kind of mystery of, of um, kind of qualitative abstract associations. You know, and Jung talks about, you know, why, why can't the dream just be straightforward and just tell us what's going on you know it's it just it just because it's the unconscious it doesn't have the, the direct language it doesn't have the the means the conscious mind does to, to concretize things and so you know we get this what, what marie louise von france calls like a letter from the self it's that wider deeper aspects of the psyche make, trying to make us aware of something um in a compensatory way something that's been often unaware and repressed and therefore it's something that, that that is pushing to come through so what when i talk about john Beebe's model like i did last week um you know that's really becomes fascinating in dreams because you get this sort of these aspects of these different parts these different sub personalities of ourselves which are all like qualitatively very different and some of them are more aware than others. And, and because they're kind of driven by complexes, they, they come up in everyday life and they grip us and we, we kind of get taken over by them. They get this emotional charge and we, get, we, we switch into different aspects and different sides of ourselves. And often without even really being fully aware, we just get so wrapped up and sucked into it that we don't even know it's happening. And I guess sometimes the dreams are trying to make us aware of that, of these these, these the way that we're being and coming across to other people that we ourselves are not even aware of. So the eight function model we talked about last week, you know, with these archetypal characters to these parts, you know, you can very much meet these in dreams. And John Beebe was very kind to explain to us last week about some of his own dream experiences, which he describes in his book, you know, about the, the Chinese laundress that represented his, his anima in the dreams. And my anima character is, um, it's, it's connected to extroverted sensation, extroverted sensing. So it's a very, you know, kind of a very sensual and physically orientated character. And often the sort of real women, real characters from my actual real life, it gets projected onto and, and symbolized by in my dreams. They're often, you know, very kind of materially orientated, beautiful characters that, that, that um, kind of, indulge in that sensory world something which often i'm kind of shutting out to follow my intellectual sign of pursuits and so often you know the fact that i'm repressing my my bodily experience and just basic being in the world physically 
often comes up as a compensation in dreams, you know, by an anima character, by a, a sensual character, a, you know, female animate character trying to, you know, draw me back into that world of, of experience, of physical experience. Um, that's one example how it can work, you know, literally trying to bring out different parts of you to, to make you conscious that, that these are there and, and to give them more of a right to, to exist in your life um, and to be more conscious of them. Uh, I could quickly just tell you about one of the dreams I've had this, this week is uh, you know, how, how can this be useful? So I've been trying to kind of analyze this myself a bit and um, I had a really powerful dream, really very vivid. It was all about a big house renovation. I was involved in managing one last year actually, but it was this big house. It, was, it wasn't a house I'd been in before, very like big and, and um, kind of impressive inside and all kind of stripped out and building work going on. Um, and, you know, there's this sort of inferior part of me when it comes to physical work and, and sort of building is, is in a real exemplary aspect of that, you know, as a lot of people would do well with their extroverted sensation, you know, as a dominant function in the building world. Um, you've got to be aware and, and physically present to do that. And it's not something that's natural to me. So I felt awkward in this dream. And the feeling, the feeling is really important because that often points to wh where you, um, what, what does it mean to you emotionally? You know, that's, that's key. So in, in this dream, you know, I, I have this feeling of inferiority that I often do around builders and people who are like physically competent and skilled. And, but I found in this dream, there was, there was some like sealant around the windows. And I, in the dream, I kind of used my finger to scrape it. I don't know if you've seen people doing that with sealant around baths and things. You can, you can run, a, it's quite satisfying. You can kind of run a finger or something around it and, and smooth it off. And you get this bead of, of sealant. And it's something, I've, it's a sort of job I've always been scared of. And in this dream, I did it. And then I kind of felt, uh, I felt proud to contribute to it in the dreams. There was something like, there was, there was a bit of a win in the dream. There was something, I'd say, something integrating there. There was something... That, that normally I would be afraid of and, and embarrassed and ashamed of. And it was suddenly that I got this little success with that in the dream. Um, and then there was, um, but then there was some doubt, you know, I, I was doubting whether the paint color matched the bottom and the top parts of the walls. And I saw these colors and they didn't quite work. And I was like, you know, I felt a doubt in that. So what am I doubting in my dream? What is it about myself that, that has some doubt? What was not matching? That's something that I haven't answered yet. Um, then I went up, there's a very really strange bit upstairs and there was people going around on harnesses, on ropes, and they were like sort of zipping along and doing stuff on, on harnesses, like access work. And I was going to take a, a photo just because it was so impressive what was going on. And then I felt like I couldn't do it because I wasn't, I wasn't a professional like them. And then I had this awe, again, I had this doubt and this awe of these people and the physical like skill that they had. Um, so this whole dream was all about this kind of a lot of this 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 thing with me and my inferior side, my my sensation and, and my relationship to that, and and the sort of the little successes and the doubts, and there's a deep sort of integrating aspect to these sort of dreams. The last bit of it, I'll just be quick and finish this. But the um, so I was there was a there was labor. They don't normally do this. Laborers were like living living in the house, and one of them had a bedroom, and it was a bit of a mess, and and there was. A kind of desk and somehow I found myself sort of lying on the carpet under this desk and I felt a bit it's kind of it was a bit it was a bit odd I felt a bit odd because kind of this person had gone out of the room of their room for a while and I was like I shouldn't be on the floor under this desk reading this thing and I found this little magazine and it was like a it was a, there's a magazine called Viz in the UK I don't know if you've seen it it's like a kind of comic strip it's, it's kind of hilarious it's, it's um kind of pretty rude and, and um funny comic strip so anyway found I was reading this comic and it, it turned out that it was from the early 2000s, like sort of 2000, 2001, that kind of time. And so there was something relevant that was symbolized in, about my life in that dream. Like, what was it about my life during that time, early 2000s? And then this story in the magazine was about the dangers of r rotting flesh, rotting flesh that was left after sort of bad health and safety with this rope work that they were doing, these, these, so there was something um, there about rotting flesh and then the dangers of leaving it. And 
in the early 2000s and and then for a while it was and then suddenly at the end like my, my little daughter joined me and like she, she snuggle likes to snuggle up she's only nearly two and she snuggles up and reads books with me she was reading this comic with me in the dream and about this this this, this character of the this rotting flesh it had been left and um it was weird because earlier in the night she'd cried out and i'd had to go and um sort of calm her down and um anyway well the thing i got from that was actually it brought me to the early 2000s when my father had it was the start of what ended up turning out to be a kind of strange kind of cancer that eventually killed him through this surgery that he had and and as i was a young man in my early 20s in the early 2000s um i was kind of separating from my parents a lot you know sort of rebelling they weren't cool i wouldn't want to be around them i was kind of going off living my life and i sort of so i barely ever talked to them much and kind of realized you know this dream made it brought what brought to the surface was the fact that you know my dad was getting quite ill at that time and actually i wasn't there like spending time and talking to him and it brought to the surface like what did he actually feel like you know for the first time it sort of brought that into my consciousness so as a compensation, that's just an example of the kind of power of dreams. You know, it made me aware of something that I'd really just neglected. Like, how was my dad feeling? You know, to be not actually asked how he was and, and, and me going to see him when he was ill. So that's kind of an example, like a long one, but I hope you've enjoyed it anyway. This gives you some insight into my own experience. Uh, thank you, Richard. Uh, Susan, you're next. So the question is, uh, you know, what are dreams? Um, what, what do dreams tell us about ourselves? And how can one use uh, dreams in order to fully actualize oneself? Yeah, yeah. Uh, I just want to say thanks to Richard. That was a lovely uh, personal example of showing kind of how they show up. Um, first, when, when kind of answering this question, I want to say that Dreams don't speak in the same language as our linear left brain, positivistic, rational ego mind does. Um, our conscious mind is really very small compared to the unconscious. The unconscious, you know, you've heard the iceberg analogy where the, the conscious mind is the tip of the iceberg. The personal unconscious, the place where uh, repressed stuff is from, where stuff earlier in life that's happened to us that's not no longer consciousness, that's that's the bottom of the iceberg, which is a lot bigger than the tip of the iceberg, but then the ocean itself is the collective unconscious. So I think it's important to kind of recognize that our conscious mind is tiny in some ways. And the unconscious is where art and visions and inspiration and energy and dreams come from. And so the language of the unconscious is very different. It's more like poetry. Uh, it's using metaphors and symbols um, I think about um, like Jesus in the New Testament would oftentimes be saying the kingdom of heaven is like, the kingdom of heaven is like this, the kingdom of heaven is like this, that he's, he was trying to express things that can't be expressed through linear language. And, and the dreams are, are, are doing that in the same sort of way. They're, they're expressing something deeper than that which can be expressed in linear language. So dreams are, are kind of like wild animals and you approach them like you would a wild animal. You need to move towards them slowly and playfully and with respect and approach them relationally instead of in a kind of an acquisitional manner. We're so accustomed in this culture to approach everything in this uh, consumeristic sort of fashion, but dreams don't really open up to you when you do that. Um, so because dreams contain a bit of wildness, because they're not tame, because they come from this dream maker who speaks a completely different language, uh, you should expect to be surprised for them to say something that changes the way you see things. Um, and it's less about nailing meaning down than about opening meanings up. Uh, uh, when, you, when you do a good uh, piece of dream work, it's gonna speak on multiple levels and lead to more questions often rather than to pat answers. So it's gonna, it, it should open you up to your imagination and your curiosity. Uh, in Jungian language, this is speaking about the difference between a symbol and a sign. A sign is, is that linear, this means that kind of thing. But a symbol is fundamentally mysterious. 
um, and it takes relationship for um, for it to kind of open up. Um, for me, this this feels like um, a lifelong study, both personally and in working with other people. I'm a I'm a Jungian oriented therapist, and when when I'm working a dream with someone, when it's working well, it's it's like improvisational jazz where you riff off each other uh, and end up somewhere you would not have gotten alone. Uh, uh, and, and that's not to say that you can't work with dreams on your own, but if you do, instead of being so focused on extracting meaning from them, play with it. Write a poem about your dream, dance a dream, draw or paint a dream, or perform a ritual that somehow says to the dream maker, I see you, I want to develop relationship with you. Uh, Jung has a, a famous quote uh, where he said, when you pay attention to the unconscious, the unconscious pays attention to you. Um, dreams are uh, often, uh, 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 Richard alluded to this, that they're compensatory, that um, an example of the, that they're trying to compensate our conscious mind. Example, I, uh, when I was years ago, I went through a, a mystery illness. And in the middle of that illness, um, it felt it, anytime you're in the middle of a kind of a midlife crisis time, it, it's hard to see anything on the other side. It, it looks very dark and you cannot imagine anything, um, anything positive coming out of it. And in the middle of this time, I had a dream. We often have dreams where we're falling, you know, we're falling, but we wake up before we hit the ground. But in, in this dream, I woke up on the ground, I, or I woke up, or, or, sorry, I was falling and I, and I came to in the, on the, on the ground in a million pieces. And these, uh, rainbow, magical rainbow penguin-like creatures came up and started going and putting me back together. And um, that was a dream in the midst that offered a different sort of picture, like, like who could have imagined that was the picture of what was happening inside of me. Um, so dreams come from this vast unconscious uh, and, and they speak Though they speak at times on an objective level, kind of commenting about the outer world, much more of the time they're speaking on a subjective level. They're commenting on our inner world, the inner world of the dreamer, the internal dynamics that are at play within each of us, the different parts or complexes and how they're uh, interacting. Um, what I see a lot of times is that people try to literalize dreams, thinking that because they utilize outer world characters and settings that they're speaking about those outer world characters and settings in a very literal way. And while this may happen very occasionally, the vast majority of dreams are about our inner world and are speaking instead symbolically. And, and, and they're speaking of what's trying to happen. What is it that's trying to be known that has not yet been known consciously? What is trying to come into being? Uh, Freud, uh, taught, helped us to see that our past impact, impacted our present, but Jung also added that the future is calling to us as well. This is a, it's, it's a teleological perspective, that, that we come into this world as an acorn and we've got this oak tree inside of us that wants to come into being. And it's, it's, um, it, it's, it's our very own unique oak tree and it's very different from a lilac bush and it's going to call us call us into being in a particular way. And that's, that's this individuation process. And dreams are a part of that. They will, they will help call us uh, in, in particular directions. So, and so dreams are where what is on its way into consciousness first shows up. So um, I guess in summary, I'll say that rarely do dreams quote unquote guide us, but they are however, very playful and they enjoy interacting and they're often working to anticipate the future and give voice to what's wanting to happen. So when we work with dreams, we open up possibilities and in, in this interplay between our conscious mind and the unconscious, uh, so that's our, our dream ego and, and, the, and the dream itself, in that relationship we can develop with the dream maker, this is what generates possibility and makes it makes way for uh, transformation. Um, it, it deepens us into our very own unique process. Um, yeah, I think that's, I'll leave it there. Oh, that was wonderful, Susan. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, it's just wonderful to have you join, uh, join the panels here. Mm -hmm. um, okay, uh, so next we're going to have, um, you know, George and 
Paul are not here yet. They will come whenever they come and we'll incorporate them into the Q&A at that point. Um, so now Richard has a, a chance to ask a question to Susan and Susan has asked a question to ask Richard, just kind of putting a question on the table. Um, who would like to go first? Okay, so go ahead. So yeah, I was just, you know, in preparation for this, like always just trying to look through Jung's collective works and seeing kind of what stuff, you know, reminding myself of what areas of, of his writing on dreams, you know, were, were, were really useful. And there's so much, you know, if you look at the actual, you can get hold of the, like the, the bibliography. Um, so the, the index, the index book that isn't in the digital version, because it expects you to just search for things, but the index is actually really good because it kind of lays out the, the exact paragraphs and things with where the things relate to. And the, the section on dreams just goes on for ages and ages. There's so much material in, in the whole collective works. But one thing that I found, which I was reading earlier, which was quite useful, um, just as a pointer is the, um, so it's in collected works. Um, I remind myself where it is again. I've just moved the page here again, but it's it's in the miscellaneous bit, like eighteen, I think, at the end. And it's the actual. It's what became the his chapter in Man and His Symbols, which is the book that was edited and then published after Jung's death. So he wrote this chapter in 1961, which I think is the same year he died, and. So it's one of the last things he wrote. It was also written in English as well. So it wasn't translated from German, unlike a lot of the, the works that he did, which make, I think, make it more accessible because it's anything I've written of his which originated in English tends to be, I think, just a little bit more readable um, from my experience. So this uh, chapter, it's in the collected works, but it's also in, in a more edited form in Man and His Symbols. Um, so that's something I would suggest is good to read because it's, it's right at the end of his life. You know, he's kind of giving a more accessible sort of summary about um, some of his ideas on dreams. Um, so, yeah, it turns up in it's called The Problem of Types in Dream Interpretation. So it's, that's, that's the. Forgive me just one second. So it is, is Collected Works 18. And it's the symbols and interpretation of dreams. There you go. So it's section two in, in Collected Works 18. Anyway, so that, that was my sort of tip for that, something to uh, people to get hold of and read. My collect, a question to the other panelists is, to Susan who's here, is um, what, if you've got any sort of references from Jung's Collected Works, you know, what would you recommend for people to read around dreams? From his work specifically? Mm, I'm not sure about from Jung's collected works. I'd have to, um, I'd have to get into the paragraphs and the, the you know, there's, there's just so much. It is a vast amount of stuff. Um, anybody who's dipped into that and, and, and Jung is, is sometimes, um, you know, my, my experience reading Jung is that I'll go along and there's a lot of stuff that he, he's, he is, He's just, he's, he's, he's such an amazing uh, genius and has put together all this stuff, but I'll go along reading stuff and I'll be like, what, what, what? And then all of a sudden there's some gem that just like opens up everything. And, and, and that's, that's been a lot of my experience with reading Jung. Um, I don't know whether um, my, my, the thing that got me into Jung to begin with was uh, that when I would read books by Jungian analysts who kind of had filtered through some of what Jung was saying and put it into everyday language. Um, and so I think I can more easily answer um, things like that, that um, a really lovely um, uh, book is uh, Care of the Soul. That was one of the early books that I read. Um, uh, and uh, that, that opens up Jungian concepts and Jung, uh, in, in a way that's very applicable and that really um, 
helps you connect with it in, a, in, a, uh, in your everyday life. I also read Women Who Run With the Wolves, which is another Clarissa Pinkola Estes, and that just, that was, that blew my entire mind back in the 90s. And, and, um, and, and for me, part of why I got into studying Jung was because I would read all these books that would um, talk, speak to me on a language that was uh, much, it was way, something was happening down in my gut while I was reading these, you know, other books I'd read and they'd be very much about my head and, and, and I would, you know, oh, the concepts, uh, I, I, I come from, my father was a mathematician and my mother was a musician and I, I think I've kind of modeled myself after my father the first half of my life and I, um, had, I knew that, I knew that heady kind of way of being, but, but, uh, Jungian works will speak to speak to a much deeper deeper level and open me up um, in ways that again this kind of surprising mysterious compensatory way that um, so I think I'm not really answering your question exactly um, because I, I don't have the specific references um, but um, uh, there's there's plenty of Jungian authors out there that um, that really help. Uh, amplify his work. Wonderful. Uh, thank you, Susan. Uh, now, would you like to raise a question for uh, Richard? Sure. Um, so recently I sat in on a, a few sessions with Jung Platform. Uh, they had a, a, a thing on individuation where they had um, like three three different analysts each day talking about individuation. But one of the panelists or one of the people speaking there was Robert Bosniak. And he said something that was really interesting to me. He said, um, in dream work, go to the place that's most alien to the ego, because that's where what wants to come into consciousness is located. He said that we're, uh, that all of us by nature are very conservative in this sense, in, in, you know, that in that we, uh, that we're trying to stay where we are rather than be elastic enough to open up to what wants to come. Um, and I guess my question is, do you, uh, how do you practice this elasticity in your life and in your own dream work? Um, again, it's just, it's something that's, it's, uh, I, when he said it, it was very interesting to me. And, I, and, and I've, I've also heard people talk about, um, you know, looking through the eyes of different characters or objects in the dream, you know, everything in the dream is alive. So, uh, you know, a, a brick, you could look into the eyes, of, look through the eyes of that, of the brick and, and wonder into what it's seeing, thinking or feeling. So that, I mean, that's one way I think about doing it, but I, I just, I wonder if you have any thoughts on that. And um, yeah. Good question. Um, I think, yeah, you know, that dream I just talked about before, that sort of daughter, baby daughter appeared in the dream and I sort of reflecting it, I, I started asking, you know, about me, you know, rather than me and how I feel about my own father. It's sort of, this sort of for me, I like reflected the positioning, like, the, like you're saying, the perceptual positioning, like how would that parents see things from their point of view? That is very useful to, to, to take that on and um, yeah, to take on the, the role of the object. Like, mm -hmm. just, yeah, how it's a really good point because you know how how a lot of it is um, you know coming to the awareness of how we're behaving in, in in a damaging or disruptive way. You know, it's the shadowy stuff. It's the stuff that we're doing that that, that causes people harm and pain and. I'm asking how, how am I treating that person or how am I treating that object? How would they respond to me? That's a really good point that you make, yeah, to, to, to take that position, perceptual positioning. Because I think it is all about that relationship. Um, I think that the psychology aspect really helps me with like the, the stretch and the, the elasticity, like what is what the most unconscious? Because I guess I know from that what is kind of theoretically practically speaking, my most unconscious aspects, you know, in terms of what I just have, have habitually do not attend to in the world, you know, what for many years before I even had the awareness of these things had value and, and so on in my life, then the things that I was blocking out. So very much that is a, it's a really good guide po post to, to seeing what aspects, um, if you understand the eight functions, then 
in the eight function attitudes as they're called you know then and, and understand what aspects of reality they kind of engage with point as to what you are unconscious of you know um and, and it's so amazing just how much there is to be conscious of in any of those domains mm -hmm. uh, and then we've only got a, a real anchor into really the one that's our dominant function on any kind of real depth and, and as we meet different people in our lives we start to realize how much there is you know like about the, the sense extrovert sensation for me you know I see people who are absolute masters in that world and it just baffles me how they do it I'm like you know how are they that in how are they that good at, at focused on, 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 on the physical world and apply to any of these aspects so yeah I think that's that's kind of how I do it uh, thank you Richard uh, Richard there is some problem with your audio could you just check uh, if there is any kind of streaming or something going on in parallel or something like that that might be reducing the quality of the sound because we are losing kind of a word here and there right. every time I don't we know. Maybe I'll just give it closer. I, I think I'm plugged into the directly into the router with a few okay. cables. Okay, so. okay, okay, that's that's um, fine. Okay, I, I think okay. Uh, two of the people are saying that they they can hear them or hear you properly. So maybe it's just just me. All right. Um, okay, so we'll go to the next step now, uh, which is going to be uh, questions from the audience. We've got four rules that we've used for the past four years that worked very well for us. So we're going to use those. Number one, raise your hand when you have questions. The way you raise your hand here in Zoom is you either type the question or you type exclamation mark or you uh, raise your hand in Zoom. Three ways of doing that. Number two, keep on topic. Today we are talking about dreams. Uh, number three, be brief and uh, so that we can have uh, the you know as much input from the panelist as possible as well as a chance for as many people to ask questions as possible and number four be courteous feel free to disagree with anything anybody says but do so courteously okay so those are the four but i'm going to make exception for the first two people i'm calling because they know they they have they know jung a lot so i want to give them a little bit of leeway to talk about uh, you know their thoughts about jung before um before they ask their questions. So they can take up to you know, three, three to four minutes. Uh, so the first one is going to be Steve, and then it's going to be John, John Roth. Um, and they can talk a little bit, uh, if they want, about, about dreams and their understanding of Jung's take on dreams, and then they can ask their question. So uh, Steve, uh, Okami Steve, it's for you. Go ahead. Yes, thank you very much. Thank you, Richard, and thank you, Susan, for your presentation. Um, I like to think of Jung as an existential thinker, even though Jung is not formally considered an existentialist, because he gives us a number of ways for us to approach our unconscious psyche that without his works would not be available. That and him extending, emanating from Freud's work in psychoanalysis is much more of a uh, kind of open-ended method in school of providing analysis and psychology. So my question has to do with the two of your presentations and the kind of insights that you were able to give me as well as the rest of the audience. Richard tells us that our dreams and their content tend to flow from our complexes, which I definitely agree with and personally identify with. Susan tells us that unlike Freud, who gave us the insight that our dreams are made uh, somewhat from experience that happened in, in our past, that they can give us glimpses of what our potential future may be. So my question is, how would Jung and how would the two of you reconcile this uh, notion that can be weaned from Jungian um, psychology that we kind of have a, um, a, a destination and that destination is our individual path of individuation because there is a, an unconscious psyche that exists somewhere in our mind that as practitioners or students of analytical psychology, we're trying to get to that. So where is the existential potential and dream analysis from a Jungian model when we have these complexes that, you know, a lot of Jungian thinkers think we can't necessarily 
uh, truly dispensed of. We have to find a way to work with our complexes and have, uh, have them inform us as people. And the idea that we have an unconscious psyche, much of which is kind of uh, as fluid as it is, it is our unconscious psyche. It's not escapable and the goal is not to escape it. The, get, the goal is to explore it, to understand it, to live with it. So where's the potential for a kind of existential telos within Jungian dream analysis? And what is the methodology? So I've, I've seen and heard a lot about what we should do to understand our dreams. But what should we do with our dream material to find our greatest potential as individuals and inform our future in a way that really puts us at the helm of the process, that really makes us the captain of the ship? Uh, I can I can jump in here if I if I understand your question right. Um, I think I've been reading um, about active imagination lately, and it's very similar to dream work. And um, the thing that that seems to be really important again is this relationship between this this mysterious unknown other and this little self, right? And that um, the, it's important not to, for us to be, uh, it, we're not looking to it to like, oh, tell us everything, right? It's not like it's the, the, um, it's the end all be all. And we're also not wanting to be um, over it to where we're the, the, our small conscious mind is the, is the knower and, and it's, it's less important. What we want is this, this uh, combustion between the two, the, the, this relationship that, um, you know, as we know with any relationship in our life is, has its own unique character. And it's, it's not, it's informed, it's very much informed by our conscious perspective. That, um, that part of what we're doing in dreams and in active imagination too is, is that we're, we're wanting to have a stance um, where we can um, be in relationship with it. Uh, so, so that brings in that existential piece, right? It's, 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 it's very much, we matter. Our, our conscious mind matters to this. It's, it's, uh, and I think that's it's very consistent with, Jung, with Jung's thought too, is that, you know, it's, it's not this, um, in, in like the, the, his work on answer to Job, that um, it's, it's, it's very much a, a, an interaction that churns that when when that when when we can have an ego that can be with this <clears throat> unconscious that that's when this this third thing comes into being which is which is allows for transformation um so that's that's what i would say on that richard would you like to add anything yeah, I'll have a quick go. I mean, yeah, it's deep stuff, isn't it? It's like the existential question. Um, the meaning of life, you know, what is, this, what is the purpose of it all? <laughs> you know, what is, what is the ultimate, like, purpose of, of the, the mind or the, or the psyche as, as a organizing system that's driven by this, I, like, not purposeful, decisions that we make, you know, that there's an energetic system that is unfolding that we can steer any more than we steer our physical body unfolding from a from an egg to a, a, a adult human being. You know, it's, this is an unfolding natural process of development. Um, what's the purpose of it? What's the end? You know, I mean, I don't see it as being anything separate from the rest of nature or the rest of the universe or any of these processes that are going on, you know, sort of reality that, that has a, a way that it, it does things. It has a, a, a natural system and a process to it that we're part of. And, and I guess that is the bigger question for me. I guess these, you know, you could look at it in a spiritual way or you could look at it Nowadays, you could look at it in, in, a, in a scientific way, even from physics. I mean, the stuff that, the way quantum physics sees the universe, you know, it's just mind blowing. You know, the literal energetic reality that we're part of. Um, and that, you know, what's the purpose of it? That individuation, you know, that's a, an end goal in itself. That, and that is, 
it's an energetic yeah that telos yeah you know that's the word you use you know this there's an energetic if not a destination then a direction kind of part of this whole energetic process of this nature um so that's the point the existential point through this Jungian work i guess is to be part of that and to enjoy being part of nature and being part of the universe and being part of something beyond comprehension but where it is actually a system unfolding and developing and part of that development is a process that seems to be about dividing and splitting and then recombining and dividing and that's kind of you know, why we become like one-sided and split and polarize you know that's just part of the, the um and then the dreams are there to, you know potentially to help us pull back together again <laughs> as part of that that system and that we've got a conscious part to play in that if we want to participate in it thank you uh richard uh now it's uh to john roth uh, john uh feel free to talk a little bit about what your understanding of uh carl jung's concept of dream is and his approach to dreams and then you can ask your question so uh, take your time Go ahead, John. Yeah, thank you. Actually, I'll address that a little differently. Um, I had an opportunity to attend a session in Berkeley, California, about some years ago uh, with John Beebe. And this was at a, a little center called the Dream Institute in Berkeley. And uh, on a Sunday afternoon, um, I flew to San Francisco for a business conference but I, during the week, but I went in a day early so I could go to this session on Sunday. There were about 20 people and uh, then John Beebe led the sessions. These were group sessions. But the particular technique that he described and he advocated was considering a dream uh, in four stages. So the first stage is just simply to articulate or write or state the dream. And he emphasized that the, your choice of words um, is very important when you are articulating what you remember or what you choose to remember. And then association is just simply your immediate reflections. But where it gets to be really fun from my point of view is amplification because amplification means you go beyond your immediate personal associations and you're entitled to bring in anything that somehow might have a bearing um, in any way from any place you can imagine. Uh, and so, and then the final stage is when, when a particular way of understanding the dream just simply seems to be right and there's kind of a resonance when, when you kind of say, oh, yeah, this, this is meaningful. This, this says something to me that, that brings a, a, a another understanding to me in a different way than what I was in the way I was doing things or the way I was considered. So those, are, those were the four stages that John Beebe uh, explained. So the first, the, so there are really two parts to this little, little statement. And the one is, uh, have you worked with that particular technique? Are you familiar with it? And the other thing I would, and, this, and the second part of the question is um, sharing dreams in groups. Um, so what happens if you can share dreams in groups is that sometimes as people are free to talk, uh, and this requires care and discipline, of course, uh, that people, other people in the group can come up with observations about the content of the dream that the individual dreamer would not immediately have have uh, found but once someone in the group raises that issue it sounds amazing and correct so so that's the question that's the second part of the question or the alternate question is uh, technique or dream groups thank you i'm i i'm i'm ready to answer that one um as well uh, thanks for your question um uh, your the the technique that you talked about that he laid out it reminds me of a, um, a another book that I wanted to recommend for folks in terms of dream work. Uh, there's a work but a book called Inner Work by Robert Johnson, and this is basically the the technique that he lays out. Um, 
and um, that uh, that that third step of of, of amplification. Um, I just I want to um, just mention like what that's like for me anyway when I'm when I'm doing my own work or when I'm or when I'm working with other people. It's it's almost like I get into kind of a dreamy state. Um, while I'm doing that, right? Like, like I'm kind of dreaming the dream on in some sense. And it's like, what, what, oh, and that kind of reminds me of this. And, 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 and actually in my life the other day, I was thinking this, you know, it's just like all these, it, it, it kind of, op this opening up process. Um, one thing that I will say about Jung versus Freud is that Freud talked about um, free association where you would take one particular thing and you'd say that that reminds me of this and then you'd take the next thing which reminds me of this which takes and you get further and further away from the original image. Whereas Jung was very much about you, you, you keep coming back to the original Im image, you circumambulate, you keep um, uh, going back to the original image. Uh, and, and then, and then that fourth step where you you feel a kind of an aha or a resonance. Um, in in dream groups, um, I've done I've actually I have a dream group that's been running since 2011 with the same people. That um, uh, it's it's a really lovely experience when you get to know each other through your dreams, right? You know, it's like um, uh, they have they have become very important people in each other's lives. Uh, over this time, uh, but uh, it, it's it's similar to how it, it, in my colloquia when I'm when I'm 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 in the interregional society a training candidate in, in there and we do colloquia, and when we do colloquia, whenever we present a case, um, they tell us you know everybody here is um, that we're all connected unconsciously, you know that there's that it's not just. Um, it's not just that person who has access that we all do in some sense, because what starts to bubble up in our unconscious, what starts to bubble up from our unconscious into our conscious minds may be very relevant to what's going on, to, to, the, to what's being talked about. So, um, so that it, it's important that when you, when you have an association like that, that like, in, like in our colloquial, they say, if you have an association, bring it out because it, it very well may be relevant uh, to the person and and always in dream groups, you know, you're kind of working with the um, everybody has the the sense of if, uh, of being respectful and not, you know, analyzing somebody else's or kind of taking somebody else's dream inventory, but more, you know, presenting from a from a case of, uh, you know, if this were my dream, this is part of this is what I would be thinking about. But, 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 but recognizing that because we are, we are not just these isolated conscious entities, that there is something deeper and, and that there are connections that are going on under the surface that we, that, um, that we are not always aware of, that it's, it's helpful to, to that, that dr gr groups will dream together in some sense. So uh, it's a little roundabout, but I hope I answered your question. Okay. Um, now we have uh, eight people lined up. Uh, so far, and uh, folks, you can keep asking questions. So it's going to be Alex, uh, Ben, Sean, Robert, Joseph, Susan, Luke, Steve, Y, uh, Steve Young, and Kat next. So when called upon to ask a question, just unmute yourself, ask a question, try to be brief, and then uh, mute yourself. Uh, let's not do follow ups so we can cover as much ground, uh, you know, as many people's questions as possible. So, Alex, go ahead. Hi there. Uh, thanks, Sri Kant. Uh, thanks to all the panelists um, and for the uh, questions. I guess my question kind of um, picks up on the previous two. Uh, originally, I was wondering about the similarities and differences between Freudian and Jungian um, uh, dream work. And that, that's already come up, and uh, Susan has said a few helpful things. So from what I understand, there is a difference between um, a kind of past-looking approach that tends to be the Freudian and a more forward future looking teleological kind of approach coming from uh, Jung. I have some experience with Freudian analysis myself um, and that actually rings very true for me because I found it after a while, I found it pretty frustrating that, you know, there was, it, there really wasn't much of an opportunity to talk about the future 
to talk about you know taking action um purposes and you know forward-looking things there was always this emphasis on childhood and parents and you know that whole cluster of things so my question is could you give some more concrete examples of how a dream might open a kind of window on the future or a kind of um, you know the possibilities um, and Susan you talked about developing this relationship with the dream maker and I'm just wondering like more specific like if you have any specific examples of how that might work that would be uh, really helpful to hear so thanks Um, I wanted to uh, address um, one piece of the, the difference between Freudian and Jungian. One thing is that um, Fre Freud thought that dreams were disguised purposely, um, that they were, they were purposely kind of obscured. And uh, Jung, Jung didn't believe that. He, he believed that they were, they, were, they were speaking the best they could, but just in a language that um, wasn't always... Um, uh, easy, easy for our conscious minds to understand. It's, it's, it's a, it's a, it's like a, a, a place that we've lost, particularly in some sense, with our, our rational uh, focus in this um, past, however many hundred years, or a thousand years. Um, and uh, let's see, what was your other question? That, that like, what, um, what was the other piece of it? What are some concrete examples of, of the future, of, of calling us into the future? Uh, let me think on that. Richard, do you have anything that you want to say? Yeah, it was interesting that um, piece in Collective Works 18 that I sort of posted to, in the chat earlier. In that, Jung's talking about uh, Freud and free association. So he's talking about how Freud would sometimes use um, like free association to just basically get people to to state what what the dream reminded them of you know in, in the broadest kind of sense of just what kind of comes up as some kind of free free association some kind of connection to it and and so Jung's a bit a bit cynical of, of this sort of process in in that chapter um, he says um, he says if you let the patient associate freely to the dream, you'll most likely try to get away as far as possible from such a shocking thought in order to end up with one of his staple complexes. But, but will, you will have learned nothing about the meaning of this particular dream. So he really kind of didn't like going down that route. Um, so yeah, when you mentioned the Freudian side, that's, that's a chapter to read because obviously I'm not, I can't really explain everything he says in it, but it lays out Jung's position on, on at least that aspect of him versus Freud's free association use in dream analysis. Next question is from Ben. Ben, go ahead. Uh, Susan, uh, did you want to respond to it? I'm sorry. Yeah, I had a, a just I, I was thinking a little bit more about that. I'm, I'm just part of the the relational quality is is that dreams will respond when you when you work with them in a way that you know like when they feel when they feel heard, when they feel like you're, um, I don't know, interacting with them, they will respond by, more, more will show up in, in some way. Um, I'm, I'm thinking of in that uh, inner work by um, Robert Johnson, he talks about um, uh, doing rituals with whatever you, you, you know, what kind of honoring the unconscious where you, where you, um, when something, when you get something from a dream that makes that that one of those aha experiences to to kind of um, uh, put it into play in some sense in your life, and that the dream seems to respond to that in some ways. Um, uh, okay, I'll stop. Okay, uh, Ben next. Ben, go ahead. Okay, so I'm interested in like contemporary psychological theories and how they connect to um, Jung's theories, like specifically evolutionary psychology or um, maybe Maslow's hierarchy of needs or something of that nature. 
and maybe trying to figure out more about dreams based on those rationales or like conceptual frameworks. I, I just wondered if like you've read anything that was like an opinion piece or something like that, or I don't know. So do you have anything in mind, Ben, specifically from say evolutionary psychology that you thought was relevant, that was linked to it in some way? Well, I don't know. I think that um, it's hard to say. I just think that dreams are essentially um, they're the unconscious process that they represent. It has to be connected to our needs in some way, shape, or form. Um, such as like, you have to go to the bathroom. It's very simple and, and you dream about it. Right. Um, another one could be that you don't want to be embarrassed or shunned by the community. You know, I remember when I was in third grade or something, having that classic dream where, you know, you show up to school and you like, you don't have pants on or something like that. And like, you don't want to be totally embarrassed right but that's about like wanting to be part of the group and not be left out um so evolutionary theory could inform um some analysis about dreams you don't want to be left out of the group because then your survival chance is lower that would be the rationale behind that idea but um i don't know does that yeah, yeah. So, so why, in what way are dreams adaptive? How do they like serve our survival? Why were they selected in, in terms of natural selection? Right. That's the thing. You know, why, yeah. why, would, why would we spend this energy doing this dreaming every night? You know, why would nature allow that to happen? I, I guess, you know, I, I mean, I guess I think, you know, from Jung's work, you know, and from understanding what happens when the psyche goes out of balance, you know, and he's talking about a psychodynamic model, a balance of the system. And, and bear in mind that most modern psychology doesn't work with an energetic system of the mind. It's much, much more materialistic and reductive than that. I'm not saying all of psychology is, but a lot of it is. Um, it's the sort of mainstream core of it is. And um, so what, you know, what's adaptive about, you know, having dreams that, as we're talking about, potentially, Bring, help to bring about the balance of this system. Well, I'd say it's very much, for some people, a matter of life and death, because we can see what happens when it goes wrong and when people end up with severe mental health problems. You know, so when the system is, is out of balance, it, it very much shows that there's a, there's a survival need there and, and, a, and a need. If this serves a purpose in terms of that balancing of the system, then I'd say it's very much adaptive. Yeah, okay, uh, next question. Uh, I'm going to go to Robert first. Robert, go ahead. Oh, sorry, uh, Susan, if you had something, go ahead, please. Please say that and then, then Robert, go ahead. Just, uh, just quickly, is the, the, it makes me think of um, that whole, Jung was, a, um, he was around when a lot of the, you know, evolutionary theories were first kind of coming into place and he was uh, a big thinker and, and connected with a lot of other big thinkers at the time. But one of that, that there's that thing, ontogeny recapitulates phylogeny. That was something that was said, which is basically, I think this is right, is it, is that it was saying that um, fetal development is mirrored into development of, of humanity as a species in some sense. This is more in kind of mainstream science. But Jung took that um, into uh, psyche and uh, talked about that um, uh, kind of the development of consciousness for humanity, like how, how that came into being is also mirrored in the development of, of the individual, you know, that we, we start off kind of one with the unconscious with our, you know, when we're in 
um, before we're born. We're kind of one with our mothers, one with the unconscious, and this little this little ego starts to come out and starts to starts to uh, gain a little more uh, ability to take a stance separate, and it starts to separate. And you know, it's like whole kind of uh, first half of life, second half of life, where the first half of life you're trying to figure out how to come into the world, uh, how to have a self. Um, and then the second half of life, you're starting to turn more inward. But anyway, those, those, that just reminded me a little bit of um, the evolutionary nature that that's kind of embedded in some of uh, Jung's concepts as well. Thank you, Susan. Uh, next up is Robert. Robert, go ahead. Oh, hi. Um, I've, uh, during my lifetime, I've recorded uh, thousands of dreams over the decades, and so I've been trying to make some sense out of it. Uh, and and I, I'm neither a Jungian nor a Freudian. I, I sort of go my own way. I try to think, try to think of uh, what might uh, make sense. Uh, dur during the daytime, we have all sorts of emotions and, uh, or, or things that are going on in our, in our mind. And when we, when we go to sleep, uh, I, I, I'm just asking if you're going to agree with this. Uh, uh, when we go to sleep, uh, we lose control of what goes on in the brain and all these things fly around. And so when I've looked at my dreams, they seem to be, uh, they, they seem to be uh, uh, all, uh, uh, the content seems to be connected with the emotions that, I've, uh, that have been going on in my mind during the day or maybe the previous day. But these emotions, are, are um, if, if we understood how the brain worked, these emotions can go anywhere. They go to the uh, distant past. I was looking at my dream from uh, a dream from last from last week, and uh, I'm working on a project. Uh, uh, Robert, Robert, please keep Rob, it brief. Uh, please keep it brief and ask a question. You, uh, well, um, if you if you uh, want to stop me, I will uh, just say if you go along with that. Ask the question is, will you go along with that? Thank you. Thank you, Robert. I appreciate it. Uh, there, see, there are, there are 10 people in line for asking sure. questions. I want to make yeah. sure as many questions get answered. So I want to keep questions fairly short so the panelists get to respond to them. Go ahead, uh, Susan. Or, uh, Susan, go ahead. So was your question, are emotions important? Uh, yeah, yeah, dreams are related to emotions, yes. Oh, definitely. Definitely, and, and it kind of uh, talks a little bit about what Richard was saying about complexes, right? Like complexes are these, you know, these, these, um, these balls of energy that, that come from, um, that come from, uh, that, that have an archetypal core, that, that you know, meaning that they, 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 the, our experiences wrap around things that are um, uh, things about what make us human. Uh, that our experiences wrap around them, but um, particularly when painful emotions get wrapped around them, that they they uh, they have a whole chain that that shows up from past experiences all the way up until present. And dreams will, and they're packed with emotion, and um, so dreams will definitely speak to that. And and you know another way of talking about them is a part of ourself. You know, you can call it a complex, you can call it a part of you. I can talk about my mother complex. You know, my mother complex has has not just my own experience with my personal mother. Again, there's that that archetypal core of of mothering which all of us know as as um, humans. Uh, but that that there's uh, experiences of my personal mother around it. But then also those experiences. What does it mean to be a mother in this culture? What is what is what is the concept of mothering, and how is that played out in my life? And then how does that show up personally in my dreams? And what are the emotions that I have? The emotions are are really where you go to in dreams. Like where is the where's the I'll ask people in my dream group, where's the piece that has the most, uh, the most juice in it for you? You know, let's, mm -hmm. let's, let's go there because that's, that's, that's what's alive. Thank you. Thank you, Susan. Uh, next question is from Sean. Uh, he asked me to read it out. Uh, have you heard of or found value in the practice of lucid dreaming, where one becomes aware they are dreaming and explores their dreams while dreaming? Um, I've heard of it, and uh, I, I think there's a book by Stephen LaBerge. I think he's the guy that, that did a lot of stuff on lucid dreaming. 
Um, and I know that there's a, a Tibetan, uh, I, I remember reading that there's a Tibetan school that, uh, Tibetan Buddhists that, that work on trying to become aware in their, in their dreams, that they're dreaming as practice for becoming aware in their lives that, they're, that this is all kind of a dream that we're in, in some ways. Um, um, again, I think a lot of times people try and um, they bring a, a, a kind of an, an acquisitional kind of um, attitude towards that, like, oh, I'm aware now. I can I can do all these things. I can I can I can get all the goodies that I can't get in my life and stuff like that. And it's I'm I'm. I keep coming back to this, but I'm more interested in this relationship rather than in um, having um, the ability to um, get something from or dominate the unconscious. So that, uh, but but I, I also know that um, lucid dreaming can be a lot of fun too. Uh, thank you, uh, Susan. Uh, next up is Joe. Joe, go ahead. Um, yeah, my question is fairly simple. It's what is the significance of color in dreams uh, and versus dreams that that aren't in color? Um, I would say that um, you know one thing I would say is what do you think? I mean, you know, I would I would wonder into that with you of what. What does it mean to you when your dreams come 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 in color? To me, it, I I have this association with like uh, something coming alive. You know, like it's it's kind of a, a we all kind of say, oh my gosh, it was like it became it became in living color. You know, there's almost a collective association with that. Of what does it mean for something to be in black and white versus something to be in color? It's it's got a lot more juice to it. Um, uh, so it, it it would mean to me, I suppose that. It, there's there's an emotional uh, there's a pr a lot of emotions um, present in a way that's less so if something's in black and white. Uh, yeah, that that's what my association would be. Okay. Uh, next up is uh, Susan Luke. Susan Luke, go ahead. Susan, look, are you there? Okay, next up is Steve Young. Steve, go ahead. Hey there, thank you. Uh, I'm here, sorry. Excuse go ahead. Me. I'm sorry. I couldn't figure out how to unmute myself. Um, I liked what Susan said about dreams bringing something that's unconscious into the conscious. And so I just wanted to ask what might be the reason for dreaming about a fear that we know we're already afraid of what would our unconscious trying to be tell, telling us? Thank you. And sorry for interrupting the other person. <laughs> Excuse me. That's a great question. Um, because what, I, what I've heard before is that if, if, you already know, if you already know the answer to what the dream is, then it's, that's not the answer. <laughs> that that, that if, you, if this is something that's already known, then that's probably not what the dream is, is, is uh, talking about, and I would want to want to move further into it and and uh, and and wonder about it more. Wonder about it more deeply. Um, that it, if it's something that feels like, oh yeah, I already know this. That's not what the dream is talking about. Thank you, Richard. Would you like to add anything? Yeah, I think you know. There's there's different levels you can look at things on, and, and sometimes the obvious can seem to to kind of sum up what it was about and I think that's usually the, po the point if something is symbolic it's exp it's expressing something that can't be expressed any in any better way than the symbol and there's usually something more abstract underlying it something that you're not you're not paying attention to so yeah I would say definitely what Susan said you've got to try and kind of ask what what is what is it that's more more to this that I'm not not seeing Okay, so now we've got uh, the following people lined up. Uh, so Steve Young, then Kat, then Taylor, then Jean, then Kate, then Donna. Steve Young, go ahead. Great, thank you. Uh, Susan, you showed your therapist card when you said, well, what do you think? So it took me back to hours of therapy there. 
Uh, quick question. Does the, uh, the uh, larger unconscious, the community unconscious or whatever that is called, is that also a, a reservoir for my dreams or is it just my personal unconscious? Absolutely. Um, in fact, a lot of times dreams will, will betray a knowledge that you don't have in some ways. Like I, I, I remember uh, Clarissa Pinkola Estes talking about how she was working with some woman on something, uh, uh, some, some symbol that they just worked on it. They couldn't, they couldn't get it to unpack itself and they just kind of said, oh, well, we, you know, this is the best we can figure at the time. And then later the woman went to Hawaii and um, um, uh, was in this uh, Samoan muse museum and that very word that was in the dream that they hadn't been able to unpack was, was a Samoan word that meant something that exactly paralleled what she'd been going through. So there, there, there is a way that we have access to a reservoir that is bigger than our conscious mind and that is co connected with, with all of humanity. Mm. So, yeah. Thank you. Yeah, I'd say as well to that that you know the idea of the collective unconscious on one level is just that we all share the same basic structure of the mind of the psyche, the same kind of qualitative structures and, and components to that system. So in a sense, it, you know, the, it's collective because you know generally that the same general issues that we're having with with um, one-sidedness and unconsciousness of certain aspects are not unique to us. You know, people for, for ever since the first humans have been suffering from the same problems that dreams have been then trying to compensate for. You know, that yes, the, the concrete details of the, you know, the personal experience of your lived life differs because you want you now living in this era, but the, the theme, the themes and the overarching problems of the psyche trying to integrate are, are timeless yeah so it's very much it's not just you it's it's the whole human experience next up is uh cat cat go ahead um thank you um i just don't know if uh if you guys have answered this question if you guys did um uh, excuse my question so i have a question about like how what is your thought about the dream that will happen in the future and how to record it or remember the dream. Thank you. Are you talking about precognitive dreams? Yeah, like the dream that will happen in the future. No, I think what she's asking is, um, you know, she's going to have dreams in the future. How will no. she recollect or remember them? Is that what you're asking? Uh, you know, like uh, how I dream, like um, what I dream, for example, whatever I dream today and it will happen the next day or the week after. What's your thought on that? And how do I recall and remember my dream? Um, so my experience is that, that precognitive dreams happen, um, but they're not very common for most people. Um, they, uh, I'm thinking about in my dream group, we've had like a handful of precognitive dreams. Um, one person dreamed of these two trees that were gonna, that, that were pivotal that, to her that ended up being uh, cut down. And, uh, but that, that's, a, it was, it's pretty rare in my experience in my dream group and in my work with clients, but it does happen. Um, again, uh, the unconscious has much more, much more information and much more knowledge about what's uh, going on than, than our conscious mind. Um, and then how to remember dreams. I think that was your second question. Um, uh, one thing that's a really nice practice to do to kind of um, uh, move toward the dream maker uh, is to start to um, move toward its language. Uh, uh, and so reading a fairy tale before bed can be a great kind of primer uh, to get your mind in the same sort of, um, uh, get your conscious mind to be talking the same sort of language. Um, yeah, that's one thought I have. 
Fantastic. Very nice. Um, okay, uh, so it's going to be Taylor, Jean, Kate, Donna, Mia, and Marco. Uh, Taylor, go ahead. Sure. Um, thank you, Richard and Susan, for speaking today. This has been great. And um, Richard, when you were talking about um, one of your dreams, you talked about how the dream was projecting these symbols onto people that you were familiar with and that you already knew. And so um, my question is like kind of twofold. The one is why would a dream um, or why does a dream kind of pick um, maybe like a person, a situation, a thing that's kind of already emotionally charged and then make like a symbol out of that. And um, that's kind of like, you know, what would be like unrelated, I guess. And um, the other question is for those of us with a um, vivid, you know, who, who remembers dreams vividly and has kind of a surplus of dream material, how do you kind of choose what to focus on because something that resonated with me too with what you said is that just there's a lot of material and there's a lot of things to use so kind of how you sort through like what you should spend your time on it's correctly just to um get a clarity on it you know you're saying about things that um were already emotionally charged do you mean like something to do with the person that was related to the symbol or yeah, so I think the example you said was um, you were talking about like your um, anima and kind of how that showed up in your dream as someone you knew in okay. your life, but it wasn't it wasn't literally about that person. But this is someone in your life that you have a relationship with. There's already kind of a narrative there, but your you know dream analysis or your what you're going to kind of like take away from your unconscious based on that symbol, you know, isn't yeah. literal. So it's, um, so I guess yeah, yeah, the yeah. question is kind of like, why add this thing on to something that already has maybe um, meaning to it, or you already have like a relation or emotion to okay, it? Okay, so yeah, so what, I mean, for me, it's, I don't have to have a relationship with that person even. It's like, it's just that they've got to have certain qualities that might that they, they, they've got to be a good hook for their projection for the symbolism i.e they've got to have the same sort of abstract qualities in some way that relates the aspect of the psyche that the, the dream is using for symbolism so you see what i mean so it could just be it could be somebody that i've, I've barely even met or just seen in the street but like really or somebody that i see on tv who embodies that kind of quality you know for me you know, somebody who's like extroverted, sensation orientated, you know, somebody who's like a, a sports person or, or a, like just someone who's extremely physically like grounded and orientated is some, they've got to have that quality that is to do with the aspect of the psyche that it's relating to. That's the whole point. It's, it's symbolism is about like any sort of good metaphor. There's something in there that relates There's something about that thing. That, that is similar to, in a qualitative way, that thing or the person that it's relating it to. You know, so just think of any, how you'd use any, any metaphor in poetry or anything like that, and, and you kind of guess, get the sense that there's a reason why you've chosen that thing to represent, because it has the qualities that you, you were looking for. Um, okay, uh, next up is, uh, so it's going to be Jean, Kate, Donna, Mia, Marco, and Sana next. Uh, Jean, go ahead. Thank you. And thank you so much for this panel. Um, so I'm interested in the evolutionary idea and also looking at the world as um, kind of a psyche in itself. Like, what do you think of this idea that all of us are individuals, human beings who have a left brain and a right brain that's trying to speak to us to maybe bring out more of um, what is generally repressed by societies. Um, do you think about those ideas as like a global collective and the anima and the animus of the world trying to express itself through different individuals to create some sort of equilibrium? That's my question. Uh, Susan and Richard, uh, go ahead. Something, yeah, something I do think about a lot, you know, how Widedness works on a cultural level. You know, what is 
the shadow of our society or what is excluded from the culture or, or the way that we see things are, are supposed to be done or you know, what kind of people are we demonizing you know in our worlds and that kind of gives us a clue as to, as to what the culture is because cultural typology you know ultimately like you know, John Beebe's written quite a bit about this stuff Jung did as well in the sense that you know he was very aware like the stuff he lived through in the times with world wars and all that kind of stuff you know there was some major upheavals and huge psychological shifts um and, and underlying what was going on you know in in terms of countries turning against people and other countries and and huge projections and and one-sidedness going on in the world that needed to correct itself so i very much do believe that the same the same things that happen on the on the, the micro level of the human individual you know they, they just reflect out into into the whole culture and you know like what if a certain individuals with certain uh tendencies get in control and, and then they set the agenda then you know it's gonna be quite dangerous for certain other people that don't fit that mold but we have to embrace that full diversity i think that's the beauty of what jung's work helps us to do appreciate all of the different aspects of ourselves and therefore the individual um, reflections of that in other people. Susan, would you like to add anything? Yeah, um, just, I mean, that whole, the whole thing is that when you push something, it's like pushing a beach ball underwater. Like the further you push it down, like it gains a lot of potential. It wants to boom, you know, come up. Uh, and and it, there are certain uh, things that we have uh, as a world. I mean, I think about shadow feminine qualities that as a world have been uh, repressed in certain ways um, for millennia and that the, the, you, you, I, I myself, I, I, it's like I feel it gathering force <laughs> in some ways you know, these days and, and that it's, it's, I wrote a piece at one point on the, uh, you know, on the, the resurgence of the shadow feminine that, it, that it's like I can feel it gathering energy like it's coming and 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 that's part of what's happening um, um, in the collective um, these days is, is my sense but thanks for the question. Uh, thank you. Uh, next next up is going to be Kate. Kate go ahead. Hi can you all hear me okay? Yes. Cool. Um, so I was uh, I was just struck by um, something I think both of you mentioned which was a, a four-step dream analysis process and I, I just came out to me that um, that exactly mirrors a, a four-step biblical text analysis process of sort of finding the the true meaning of a, a biblical passage and and that sort of mirrored something I'm very interested in which is a uh, interpreting biblical and mythical stories as though they are sort of dreams of a, a culture in some way the the best example being Adam and Eve suddenly realize they're naked it was a very common dream image. So I was just wondering if any, if either of you could comment or had any thoughts about any connection between um, dream analysis techniques and understanding of biblical or mythical or just generally uh, any fictional stories. Absolutely. <clears throat> that's, um, you, I mean, I, if, if you get into reading some Jung, you'll find out that that's, he, he, that's how he saw, uh, uh, mythological or religious or um, alchemical texts that they that that they were they they spoke in the same sort of language but they were speaking not for an individual but fairy tales as well so um, yeah I think if you it, I don't know whether you've done much reading of, of Jung or of, of people who have written by you but uh, you're in for a real treat if that's um, uh, your bent already Excellent. Uh, next up is Donna. Donna, go ahead. Uh, Donna, you had a comment or a question. You need to unmute yourself. Okay, let's go to the next person. Uh, Mia. Mia, go ahead. Hi, guys. Thank you for holding the meeting. Can you guys hear me? Yes, uh, but you need to speak into the phone. It's uh, We can barely hear. Go ahead. Okay. Um, Wait, let me see. Go ahead. Right. Oh, okay. Um, 
So my question earlier that I kept there is about the can we sorry Susan. You seem like having difficulty listening to my question. But hold on, let me figure out a way. Um I will I'll come to you. Uh let's let's go with Marco. Okay. Marco. Sure. Marco, go ahead. Um yeah, my question uh was uh sometimes I'll have like a uh, deja vu like in you know my waking life but I'll have like um deja vu of of a dream that I've had in the past um and I just the question was like is it um what does that mean and is it like significant and what can I do about it thanks Uh, Susan or Richard? I didn't quite catch the question fully, but um, can you just repeat the first bit again? Not possible. Um, sometimes I'll have deja vu, like of a of a dream I've had, but in a but in like a waking life in my waking life. So it's almost, it is like, it feels like a precognition had happened, but you, you kind of then go, oh, yeah, I've seen this before. I've seen this place before. Or I've been, this has happened before. Is that kind of what you're meaning? Um, yeah, but, but it's like, it happened like in a dream, like not, but not like in, not in waking life. It's, inc it's inc incredible. Yeah, I, I am. Um, what is the significance of it? Well, again, it's, it's what it means to you, like it's within that specific context. Okay, um, let's, let's do one thing. Um, Susan needs to go, you're, Susan, you have about five minutes or what, what's, what's, what's the time period for you? Uh, I can- Yeah, I can, I can hang on for five minutes. Five minutes, okay. All right, uh, so we'll take a couple more questions and then we will we'll wrap up. Um, uh, Mia, are you ready with your question? Uh, yes, I am. Can you guys oh, hear me sure. clearly? Yes, okay. please, go ahead. Go ahead. Um, so for me personally, I'm pretty intuitive. I'm an ENTP. And uh, ever since I was little, um, I always have dreams and then it comes true in the daytime. I mean, this question has been mentioned many times already uh, previously. But my question is, because Susan mentioned earlier that a conscious mind uh, cannot easily um, catch the idea from the unconscious mind. So b through the, the media that of dreams, we can actually understand our consciousness better in a way. So do you think that uh, the dream like as a media can also be considered as a um, tool like for people to like be more intuitive to the world? I'm not sure I understand your question. Uh, can uh, you said, can the dream what? Can we? Um, I'm saying like, can we um, use the dreams as a tool to perceive the world more intuitively? Sure. Yeah. I mean, the, the dreams. The more you understand, I mean, we we project onto the world all the time, right? That um, somebody had asked a question earlier about why, why do you pick a particular, why does the dream maker pick a particular person? Because we have a projection onto that person. We're, we're everything in the world, we're projecting onto um, our, our unconscious material to some sense and, and, and experiencing the world through that filter. So the more that we can start to unpack that and, and um, understand, have a little bit of a, the, the more space we can put between um, being fused. It, it's so easy to get fused with unconscious material if we can have, it, even if we can name something or step back from it a little bit and have a little perspective, which is part of what dream work lets us do, that it, it gives us uh, a whole different um, ability to interact uh, in a uh, in a way that's less unconscious and more conscious. Okay, let's take the last question from Sana. Sana, go ahead. Yeah, hi. Uh, during meditation, like at the last leg of my meditation, especially if I'm stressed, I'm concerned about something, I'll get this common messages, like somebody is talking to me and they 
they're giving me simples. I can see simples or I, I hear text. And I challenged that. I said, okay, this is my brain talking to me just to ease me down. So I wanted, I said, if somebody is actually talking to me, I need a proof. I need something out of my, like something that I haven't been exposed to. And then I, I get the symbols from like Hinduism and I'll go Google it. And it, it says the same thing, but in different cultural language and symbols. What does that mean? Um, so, uh, uh, sorry, just a second. Okay. Sorry. Sorry. Uh, Susan, uh, go ahead. There was, there was a problem. Um, uh, go ahead. Please repeat. Yeah. Uh, so, uh, uh, back again to Clarissa Pinkola SD, she would talk about disembodied voice dreams that a disembodied voice is often the voice of the self um, that is um, chiming in on what's going on. And, and at the end of meditation, you're really in a very, I'm imagining you're in a fairly dreamlike state anyway. Uh, so it's, it's not that different from, from a dream. And so you have, you have a disembodied voice that's chiming in. Uh, that would, to me, be a, uh, I would be curious about thinking about it as a self, a voice of the self. Okay. But, um, but just, uh, uh, wait, wait, information that I never been uh, exposed to before. Yes. Sorry. And the self knows things that <laughs> that you don't know. If there is a, this, the, again that 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 thing about the collective unconscious that we are tapped in in ways that we don't know. Wonderful. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Richard and Susan. Susan, uh, this is your first time here in the panel, and. I know that you had specifically asked to be included in this panel on dream and it was wonderful. Uh, you know, I thought you brought a lot of insight and a lot of deep and it's always, you know, wonderful to have Richard, um, always, always a pleasure. Um, so thank you very much um, uh, to the panelists. So now we're going to go to the next stage. We are going to break into breakout rooms. Um, we'll say goodbye to Susan. And um, all you have to do is to just stay put. I'm going to divide you into breakout rooms. Give me just a second.